Dr. Yuri Maltsev is a Mises Institute Senior Fellow and Professor of Economics at Carthage College, but he's best known as a Soviet defector who worked as a government economist and witnessed firsthand how the economy of the former USSR worked or didn't work. He's famous for having advised senior government officials on both sides of the Cold War and is sought after by Western media as an expert on the Gorbachev perestroika era. We discuss not only his defection from the former USSR, but also his defection from the Marxist economic mindset, the crime of reading Hayek, why so many Westerners still have a naive and romantic view of socialism, how the ruble was nothing more than a fiat rationing coupon, and why people with contempt for consumerism never visited a Soviet grocery store. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mises Weekends. I'm Jeff Dice. We're very pleased to be joined by Dr. Yuri Maltsev. Yuri, how, do you, how are you today? Oh, I'm very fine. Yes, yeah, very nice to be with you today. Well, full disclosure, I had a, an opportunity to meet Yuri in Chicago once uh, via a mutual friend. We've had dinner. Obviously, you've been to the Mises Institute many, many times over the years, and our listeners are probably already quite familiar with your work. But I'd love to throw something out to you because I get this all the time, this impression all the time, is that Americans and rich Westerners still have a naive and unrealistic view of socialism. They don't really seem to get what it's all about. But having lived in the former Soviet Union, do you find this, uh, do you find Westerners overly credulous about socialism? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's very difficult, I would say, for the Westerners to, uh, who, uh, we, who are blessed with all this abundance of material goods, of, of this, uh, this uh, wonderful choices they have in life, uh, to believe that somewhere else, somebody else does not have these choices. Uh, that's why I would say that many, uh, many rich Westerners, uh, they embrace socialism. They think they will have Everybody else would be would, would the same as well. Let's speak about the college students you teach. You've been at Carthage for about 20 years. So today you're teaching the millennials uh, relative to their parents who are mostly baby boomers. Do you find them receptive to market ideas or do you find them also uh, somewhat brainwashed, somewhat, uh, un, you know, do they lack knowledge about what socialism really is? I would say that during my 23 years already at Carthage, I, I, I can see that there is a lot of uh, cultural changes are going on, negative cultural changes are going on in our society, uh, because uh, students coming out of the public schools here in the Midwest are getting more and more brainwashed and more uh, socialistic uh, than, um, than they were 20 uh, 20 years ago. Um, we have some uh, liberty-minded people have some dense, however, in this mentality, because on campus we have a, a thriving um, uh, Ron Paul group, we have a um, Young Americans for Liberty group. So um, uh, it's, I think that we should be very thankful to Ron Paul for introducing ideas of Austrian economics uh, into a mass audience. Um, uh, today, a lot of students know what Austrian economics is all about, uh, while 23 years ago, very few, if any, uh, would recognize this term. Uh, from another hand, a uh, majority of students are still, I would say, are still within the, the so-called mainstream uh, socialist ideology, uh, which is predominant in the United States. We mentioned Austrian economics. This is a question I've always had for you. I mean, I can understand coming to the United States as a defector from a, a Soviet economy that was dismal, that you m might have an incentive to embrace free market or capitalist principles. But how did you come to be an Austrian as opposed to uh, a monetarist or a Chicagoite or a neoclassical economist? I would think that uh, Austrian school is the most logical. It goes farther than any other school in repudiating evil. It's the school which is both scientifically proven to be true and also has the highest moral ground because the basis for 
Austrian economics is liberty, is liberty, is, is individual choice. And uh, that's why it's not, we, I'm not Austrian, not because Austrian economics would lead to, I would say, production of more bathtubs than any other system, but because it's based on liberty. And liberty, individual choice, our subjective values, this is, uh, this is a real, true human values real, true American values. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm proudly Austrian. How I became Austrian, I think uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a Glenn Beck show um, uh, together with Tom Woods, and we were praising Road to Serdom by Hayek. Uh, um, and Road to Serdom was my gateway to to freedom. Uh, I read Road to Serdom when I was at Moscow State University. At that time, you could get a uh, jail sentence up to seven years just for having a book. Uh, for passing this book around, you could get 12 years. And today I am proud to give my students extra credit for reading Road to Serfdom. So your physical possession of the book was almost like a black market good, like an illegal drug, for instance. That's right. That's right. And it's, I would say and it was treated as drugs because... Karl Marx, uh, his infamous um, quip is that religion is the opium for the people. And so religion would be treated as, as, a, as a drug industry, as a legal drug industry in the Soviet Union. Uh, but then they, uh, because communism itself, socialism, is nothing but secular religion. It's religion which wanted to establish its total monopoly over people's thought. So any deviations from that monopoly, and definitely Austrian economics was exactly the opposite from socialist ideology, uh, was punishable, and punishable in a very severe way. I'd like to touch on what you mentioned earlier, which is consumerism in America and in the West. Uh, there's very few Americans and Westerners, really, who have ever known anything other than material abundance. Let's say only the older World War II generation that has some memories of the Great Depression, for example. I just wonder, could I get your take on how this colors people's perceptions of, of economic and government systems? Because they've just never lived in a time or a place where there wasn't material abundance. I think it's very easy to be anti-consumerist when you have a lot of things to consume. It's the people, I mean, I have a lot of uh, colleagues my, my, uh, in, in academia who would, um, who would uh, bash Walmart or uh, would, would, um, uh, um, would, would treat McDonald's as a great uh, culture slayer overseas and whatnot. They don't realize that people want to consume, that people want to have their kids to be, to be healthy, to be to be well fed and to be happy, and uh, consumerism is nothing wrong with consumerism. Uh, and and I would say that that recently I met one of my colleagues who was like the Walmart basher on my campus in the Walmart, um, happily buying stuff. So I would say that that it's easy again to to reject consumerism when uh, when you're rich enough. Uh, and that's why limo liberals, as we call them, um, uh, they, from one hand, uh, from one hand, they trash capitalism. From another hand, they're happily enjoying the fruits of capitalism. One of the examples you've provided uh, from your time in a, in a system in a society that had anything but material abundance, the former USSR, is in the form of an article entitled "What Soviet Medicine Teaches Us." This was on Mises.org a couple of years ago. I'm just hoping you could speak a little bit about your experience with Soviet medicine, not only the shortages that a collectivized medical system engenders, but also the, the bribes that I think some people may not understand. Yes. Well, if you ration something, then definitely you are getting a huge black market for these goods or services they are trying to either ration or whatnot. Obamacare is exactly for rationing um, uh, health care. Uh, it reduces choices of people, and according to the president himself, um, that uh, Obamacare, the goal of Obamacare is to reduce costs. And if you reduce costs, how you can reduce? You either squeeze providers, you don't pay medical people enough, or you deny care. So in Obamacare, that's both. And I am very much surprised that my fellow Americans uh, uh, are giving up their freedom for nothing, for promise that it will be cheaper. Yes, the cheapest healthcare would be no healthcare. 
uh, cheapest health care would be, I don't know, in 1960, how much you would pay for for uh, heart bypass or for for hip replacement. Nothing. You would save a lot because these things were not available. And I and that's why I'm I'm really kind of this this I think this uh, great leap forward towards socialism by nationalizing almost one fifth of the United States economy uh, through Obamacare. I think it is the most disgusting development that United States experienced in its own in its history. Then. Um, uh, in the Soviet Union, definitely uh, the health care was provided mostly to the people in power. If you are a high-ranking member of the Communist Party or, 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 or government, uh, then you have an access to good health care. For gray masses, uh, they treated them as slaves. Uh, the slaves and, uh, and if slaves uh, were in productive age, for example, if they're, uh, if they're below 60 years of age, then they would have more health care available for them than if you are after that time. Uh, then, for example, old age survivors in the Soviet Union uh, were not provided even with elementary uh, health care. They, uh, they would not be provided with any surgical care. Uh, their their uh, hemodialysis uh, would be stopped uh, for people uh, after 65. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that, that Soviet, Soviet medicine uh, is really has a lot of, to teach us because it was, I would say, the most vivid example of, of inhumanity, of the evil of socialism. Shifting gears for a moment, let's talk about Soviet monetary policy. How did the ruble operate in what was effectively a closed economic system? Yes. Well, the ruble was not a currency, actually. It was also some kind of a rationing coupon. Um, <clears throat> I worked for a while as a, as a chief consultant of Soviet Bank for Foreign Trade. Well, worked was a kind of overstatement of my activities. Nobody worked in that bank. But... <clears throat> But uh, we had a joke at that time. The joke was, what is the true exchange rate between the dollar, the British pound, and the ruble? And the answer was that one dollar cost one pound of dried rubles. And that was exactly like that, because the ruble was not based on the market economy. So the commissars would print as many rubles as they can. Uh, to some extent, it was a kind of Federal Reserve uh, of the United States, which went completely amok. They would print the amount of ruble according to the plan they make. For example, if they want to build another huge railroad from nowhere to nowhere, then they would need to pay, say, 16 billion rubles in wages to workers who would, uh, who would work on this. Um, and another, say, 15 billion dollars to people who would work for these workers. And so then they would, um, they would order the Minister of Finance to print, to, to print three, 31 billion rubles, new rubles. And then they will see if they don't have enough rubles, they will print more. They will print more. And that's, uh, that's why ruble didn't have much value. And that's why socialism actually didn't work. I worked, my first job was at the Soviet Department of Labor. And our Minister of Labor, another, uh, another socialist bureaucrat, he thought that we should just introduce new systems of payment, like payment by results, so then, uh, or uh, would, would um, kind of um, introduce uh, uh, the, the um, um, peace rate everywhere instead of time rate. And they've tried to. And it turned out that nobody wanted these rubles anymore. Because what if, if you don't have anything to buy with these rubles, then the ruble would be just a ticket, as they would just say. There's a ticket for a fight. Ticket for a fight for something real. So that's the, the I would say that, that this type of monetary policy is a very good example for us not to follow and to return back to sound money. Any memories, Yuri, of your consumer experiences as as a young boy in Russia? What, for instance, what was the grocery store experience like? I remember my first grocery store experience was when I was seven years old. I was spending a lot of time after school standing in long brand lines in Kazan, uh, 
because my my grandmother, who was working, she would put me in this line, and I would be just standing in this line hours and hours and hours. And then after after work, she would come and replace me in this line, and we will get some bread to buy. So that was in 1960s. That was the bleak time of Nikita Khrushchev. Um, and then, then um, uh, when we moved to Moscow, Moscow was a little bit better uh, from point of view of supplies. So there were no bread lines. Um, it's like in every concentration camp, the best place to be is near the kitchen. And Moscow was one, was kind of a showcase uh, for the Westerners. Uh, but even in Moscow, it was everything was rationed. If you don't have rationing coupons, you don't have access to meat or to uh, things like that. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I remember when Soviet Union was uh, already coming to its end, then uh, the, and it came to its end because Mr. Gorbachev um, uh, uh, he uh, he had a policy. Uh, of returning to human face of socialism. He didn't understand at all that socialism can exist only based on mass murder, only based on coercion and crude violence. And he decided to kind of to make socialism with human face. And because he made this point, then people thought that nobody would be shot anymore and people stopped working. And at that time, this shortage became pervasive even in Moscow. Even in Moscow, people were hunting for food. Uh, even in Moscow, you could buy whatever you want only at the black market. Um, so it's, uh, it, I have a lot of friends, uh, had a lot of friends in that time in the Soviet Union, in medical profession. Can you imagine there? They would be, they would be uh, uh, medical people, doctors, and, and they wouldn't have a telephone at home. Um, uh, the telephones were nine telephones per 100 households. To get a telephone, you'd need to go and bribe all these little officials from the, from the government uh, phone company uh, or, or party people. Uh, the same with cars, for example. There was 1.2 cars per 100 households. And that would not be just private cars. 1.2 would be all cars in the Soviet Union, including cars which belong to the military, to the party, to the, to the KGB. Uh, they will all be divided by the number of households, and then you'll get 1.2. So this um, this was miserable in a country with 11 time zones, the country which could be the richest country in the world, uh, which uh, which had almost uh, everything possible and possible natural resources. Well, it's interesting you bring up the automobiles. Do you, re do you have memories of the Tabat or or the the Soviet limo? If I recall, was was the Zil or something along those lines. Yes, yes. The party people they were uh, driving this uh, this limos, um, and uh, usually all the escorts of these limos. Uh, while the cars in the Soviet Union were kind of like made it your make it yourself kit uh, for the people, uh, so the people could buy cars. And think was a was famous joke, but it has all the truth in it. That in the in the 1980s to to buy a car. You would need um, you would need to pay in advance. You go to the uh, government car distributorship. Uh, you pay the full price in advance. There was absolutely no loans, no credit in the Soviet Union, and so you you would you would pay in advance, and then they would tell you that when your car will be delivered to you. And uh, and the joke was that one gentleman is coming to this uh, car distributorship, paying in advance, and and um, the the car dealer is uh, telling him, he said, well, comrade, uh, your car will be delivered on the 9th of September of uh, 2021. And the gentleman is looking at his appointment book. He said, morning or afternoon, sir? And he said, what's the difference? And he said, well, in the morning, a plumber will come to fix my toilet. And that's exactly how the Soviet economy worked. So it's uh, it's very sad that um, that many people don't realize that socialism is not working. It will never work because it does not have any incentives for people to do anything. Because of that, to make people do what they want, the socialist leaders would resort to murder, would resort to coercion. That's why anywhere from 43 to 60 million people were murdered in Soviet Union alone. 78 million people were murdered in communist China. So if you will look at any socialist state, you would see 
uh, huge and huge mass graves as monuments to socialist experiments of the 20th century. And the bad thing about this is, as Soviets would say, that the only lesson of history is that it does not teach us anything. And we have people like Mr. Obama and people around him, uh, as well as many others, uh, who think that we, we can have a free ride to socialism, uh, to have some kind of a socialism with human face, to have to have uh, uh, everybody living uh, the same way uh, and everybody supporting the government. And that's what I'm, I'm uh, very sad to see. I came to the United States 26 years ago already, and I, it's very sad for me to see how this country is, is uh, losing its freedoms, losing its choices, um, and, uh, and embracing socialism. Uh, so that's, that's very, very sad. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank Dr. Yuri Maltsev for his time this weekend. Sobering and a cautionary tale for all Americans. Yuri, thanks very much. Good to talk to you. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Very good to talk to you.